if architects value themselves more, you know, I think we need to push up fees now. I think you know, enough's enough. We just need to communicate that. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today I had the distinct pleasure of hosting Gurmit Sian, the visionary founder of Office Sian Architecture and Design. Gamit's exemplary work has garnered recognition at both regional and national levels, a testament to his unwavering dedication to enhancing our built environment. His passion lies in engaging with communities to uplift and transform spaces, ensuring they enrich the well-being of people from all walks of life. Gamit's influence extends beyond his practice. He chairs the London Borough of Southwark Community Design Review Panel and serves on other several panels, including Redbridge, Camden and Harrow. As a London Mayor's design advocate, he also plays a pivotal role in shaping our city's future. His contributions to the London Festival of Architecture 2024 as a curator and his accolade as Reba London Project Architect of the Year underscore his profound impact on the architectural landscape. In this episode, we discuss the importance of raising fees in the industry and what impact that could have on the accessibility of the industry. We talk about how to maintain design quality through building a very deep and trusting relationship with your client and what sorts of communication skills are essential to maintaining that relationship. And we also discuss a lot of insights that uh, Gurmi has had through running a small design firm which is committed to design excellence and civic responsibility. So really inspiring conversation here with Gurmeet. So sit back, relax and enjoy Gurmeet Sian. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Gummy, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for inviting me. It's good to be here. An, well. a, an absolute pleasure to be speaking with you. You're the founder of Office Cian. Um, I've been a fan of your work over the last few years and have been very impressed with the, the, the kind of sense of community responsibility, civic responsibility that your work embodies the projects that you've done where you've been able to produce an enormous amount of high caliber design with seemingly very small tight budgets and you know and you and you've and you've served and I've been interested in the kind of business model that you've been using where I know you do a lot of um, community based work perhaps there's a fair chunk of pro bono work in that and then working with uh, maybe higher end clients in you know, glamorous parts of Hackney doing beautiful rear end extensions. And, you know, and I, I think it's a, a very thoughtful design practice that, you know, that you've been putting across. So I'd love to talk a little bit about what, how did you get started? I think it's a really interesting question. And thank you so much for your kind comments. That's really appreciated. Um, sometimes you just work in a silo, you don't quite know if it has an impact, but it's good to hear some feedback um, at least. I think the journey of architecture is um, didn't necessarily start in architecture school and I always think back to my childhood um, and how I started thinking about generally the environment around us and how we can manipulate it um, uh, for good and sometimes in, in strange ways and to answer the question of how it all started I, I can't not reference um, my musical upbringing, which uh, was beautiful, fantastic. I I was raised within a Sikh family, and generally amongst Sikh families, um, there is a very strong connection with music 
uh, and the kids being frankly forced to learn music harmonium and talking. harmonium and singing vocal really. right oh, okay and okay. and so my i on reflection my architecture education started with those music lessons with those very patient teachers who um you know very early on i was learning the basics but maybe at the age of 11 12 13 there's there's a strong element of improvisational music in uh, in asian music or north indian classical music and my teachers would speak to me less about notes and tunes but speak to me in terms of what's the mood that we're trying to create mm -hmm. is it sweet you know how big is this room how can we make it bigger how can we make it colder how can we make it lighter how can we make it darker this is the language that we use within architecture and this is the language that i use today but my music teachers weren't thinking as architects they were thinking as practitioners who they thought they could shape the environment sonically mm -hmm. and i realized in my mid 30s that actually my my architectural brain was was really being motored at that point through some incredible teachers and so that's where um, and that's the language that I still use today and that's kind of how I feel about creating architecture of course through GCSEs A levels through formal architectural training at Liverpool uh, and then um, uh, expressed in different ways through writing at the Bartlett's you know that was that's pretty standard um, and it's standardized because it's a profession so it's not much not much wiggle room there but really how I am now is is a collection of lots of different people uh, influencing me in many ways and that's not necessarily my architecture tutors mm -hmm. they did but reverse back six seven eight years it was through music um, and that's a fantastic well, it, it's, it's interesting actually now you say that you were brought up as a, a musician or had a strong kind of musical upbringing and the, the sort of communal sense of making music together is something which is quite profound um, and it's, such an in, you know, it's one of the most enjoyable aspects of, of being a musician is playing with other people and also being able to create a kind of community that's, you know, everyone joining in something together and, and you can totally see that in the sorts of you know, the way that I've seen you speak about your projects, yeah. that kind of sense of engagement with other people. And also, you know, there's something wonderful about music where everybody can participate in it, even if you're not a musician, you know, just being able to clap or just sing or, or just like enjoy and your reaction to it is, is enough. I think that's so true. I mean, you know, as a kid, I didn't go to music lessons to become a musician. Mm -hmm. You know, there there are many many factors. I mean, it's probably a bit of childcare as well. My parents like let's just get let's get rid of him for 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 an hour and a half, and um, and I understand that. Um, but it was to expand the mind. It, it was to draw a connection with the culture. Of course, you know, my parents moved to this country in the '60s, and 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 they're probably fearful of their children losing culture. Mm -hmm. But but it was about expanding the mind and showing something so that it can be in a civic or community setting. In this case, a a religious setting, but not always the case. I played uh, many non-religious settings as well so that, that so that there was an element of um communal mm -hmm. sharing um and i i i'm pretty sure i'm probably post rationalizing a lot about who i am now uh, based on my own uh, upbringing but uh, but i can't also not i can't delete that from who i am now mm -hmm. either What's also interesting about the tradition under which I was musically trained, um, and I'm not a very good musician whatsoever, I, I just want to put that out there, I'm pretty rubbish, but, um, but in the North Indian classical music uh, tradition, there, there are no orchestras. There, 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 you know, there haven't really been any world-class orchestras coming out of India, really, or Pakistan. Effectively, it's a tradition of breeding soloists mm -hmm. who go up on stage and then do and say something, but engage the whole audience, and that's also interesting, actually. Mm -hmm. And 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 th there's a there is a parallel with how we see architects 
not necessarily how architects should be, but how we see architects. Mm -hmm. uh, male, going up on stage, saying something, showing something, and the audience clapping. Mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, not everything that, that I learned as a kid is positive, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. There, there are certain things that, that, that I want to challenge as well. So yes, the sense that I can showcase something and there's a communal element to it, but also a sense that actually I want to be part of more of an orchestra really yeah. as, as opposed to a soloist. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I want to feel that I'm part of a band as opposed to just the lead singer and, and you know, someone playing drums in the background. So, and, that, and that is an interesting parallel that, that, that I think about. With your own practice, I know that you were practicing solo for, for quite a while. N now, how many, are you still practicing solo or no. you have a team? No, we have a team of three. Team of three. Um, but but that's that's kind of been a very gradual journey mm -hmm. to actually get to that, and and I haven't necessarily followed the path of growth in terms of judging it through staff numbers or or maybe turnover mm -hmm. always, um, uh, and maybe that's not a good thing actually, <laughs> but um, but but what I can say is that that I have been continually growing, mm -hmm. and my growth has been. Um, exponential mm -hmm. uh, from starting up a practice um, pretty much organically from the day that I've completed my part three mm -hmm. um, not having not having worked in a big practice um, worked in some really wonderful nurturing pra practices but not necessarily ones that I, that I would take away a lot in terms of a business culture mm -hmm. um, uh, nurturing uh, as they were and positive as they were so that that growth has been very gradual um, and and it has been at a pace which um, is perhaps um, becoming of a person who is not from an architectural tradition mm -hmm. it's from a fairly working class background and and is still trying to understand uh, not only his own skills but how to communicate them yeah you know which which is um, much underrated I think. Mm -hmm. When you set up your practice, um, how did you win those first projects? What were the the first things that you en get engaged in? I think I think winning those practices that I wouldn't use the word winning. <laughs> uh, given given or <laughs> flopped over the line is perhaps perhaps the uh, the expression. I my most important client was probably the first one. Mm -hmm who somehow put their faith in a young architect just qualified with their home of all the things the most intimate project is a home and said okay fine let's go for it and they were a relative of um of a client um that i had when i was a part two and so a few years down the line they wanted to do something with their home and, and they were like, well, um, we worked with Gurmeet when he was, um, I mean, I, I, I don't think clients necessarily know the difference between part two, part three, whatever, but it's like, we worked with uh, Gurmeet when he was working at that studio. Um, let's see what, what he's up to. Uh, and, um, and that was a really wonderful nurturing relationship. Of course, I was also cheap. You know, and of course there was f familiarity there, yeah. but but um, but it was really great to be held in that space by clients who knew me, I knew them, and it was a typical back extension. Um, I was allowed to, you know, within a, a very tight budget, express ideas, and you know, I I didn't think too much. I just did, and I didn't think of it being publicised or competitions or anything like that whatsoever but it got fairly well publicised and it got shortlisted for competitions and I thought ah okay so um, okay uh, maybe I'll think about that the next time so it was a very um, haphazard route through but the key thing was was a client putting their faith in mm -hmm. a young architect and I wish more would do would do that today. This was the, the project where you were using the tiling on the outside the yeah. kind of vertical stacked. Yeah that's right it, it was just bricks you know what what is the budget what is the likely contractor's skill level mm -hmm. which is you know something that we don't need to think about what is you know we're not going to get a super duper contractor we're going to get a normal contractor who's dealt with you know pretty standard box back extensions 
okay, so we have brick, we have wood, we have glass. What do I want to do and how, how do I want to do it? Yeah, so it, it's a soldier course of, of brickwork and just expressing it in a, in a way which is, is careful and with care and just, you know, working with a contractor who probably hated my guts at the end of it. But, <laughs> but, but I think even, even he's like thought, actually, yeah, at least I've done this once in my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I'm going to go back to doing breeze block back extensions. <laughs> yeah. Um, just plaster over it. Yeah, just plaster over it. Um, you, in, interestingly, you've done a lot of uh, kind of, you know, we said earlier on, but kind of community projects. And uh, I, would I be right in thinking some of it's, some of it, a lot of it's been pro bono? No, no, no. It, it's very early on. You know, right, I, I okay. think that my, my, my route into community or civic architecture has has not it hasn't been a mission for me from the start right you know it was i think that in practice um, when i was a part two and part one there, there weren't those types of projects around there was like you know rich back extensions and and new homes and mm-hmm. and that was what i thought i'd never worked i never knew what it was to be an architect i never knew anybody else who, who was an architect this was my world and it was being created mm-hmm. around me and that was my idea of what an architect would be um, around 2008 and nine, there was obviously a huge worldwide wide economic crash, and I had no work. And I left London, and I and I moved back to my parents' home, to the bedroom that I was raised in, and um, that was a low. It's uh, humbling. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But also, I was very fortunate. Yeah. You know, I was very fortunate to actually go through, have the parents to accept me back, of course, and and to see. You know, they they have been through recessions before. They were like, "Don't worry, you'll, you'll get back on your feet." Um, and when you're going to get married? So, <laughs> um, and um, so so going through that process, I realised that man, I've got to get out of this town back into London. And I connected again with perhaps the people that I lost contact with when I was growing up. And maybe I connected again with a bit of music. And I, and I realized that actually there is some, some work that can be done in, in communities and just helping out and with charities. Mm-hmm. And that work was fairly pro bono, but it, it wasn't totally. And so, I, so I would, I'd look on some very early message boards and like say architect needed to, to provide a design access statement for, for, for like a, a small community building. And I would go in and I would do it really. And like commute from Maidenhead to actually London. I realised that actually I had been missing a lot of the joy of my childhood, which is being in this place of community. You mm-hmm. know, and charities it can be very challenging working with with charities, but but there is the concept there that they you know they are doing something for the social good, and mm-hmm. and I wanted to be part of that, and I realised that I had forgotten about that, and how how can I incorporate it into my professional life? Mm-hmm. And so those early projects. They weren't necessarily pro bono. There, there was some pro bono, but it, but it was more of the sense that this is where I want to go, and just right. slowly working up from there. Um, and of course, not leaving the high end resi behind mm-hmm. uh, because I knew that that had to be well, part and parcel of it. Working with some of these more kind of community based uh, projects, what are some of the 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 challenges and skill sets that you need to bring? to the table working with, you know, sometimes I'm imagining that it's kind of multi-headed clients or you're working with a congregation of, of, yeah. of people, perhaps sometimes um, depending on the level of sophistication of the organization, you might have um, kind of people who are there as, as that's not their full-time activities or other times you might get more of a kind of full-time professional basis. What are the sorts of skill sets that you've found that you've needed to develop to be able to work really intelligently and sophisticated with these sorts of uh, clients? I had to, well, working in communities and with charities is harder mm-hmm. than with private clients. I think that on many, on many metrics or judgment scales, it is harder. There are hard bits about working with private clients. There could be more choice, and more sophistication in the final product. But the challenges that I had to overcome with working with community clients was that, as you mentioned, this isn't their full-time job. They are, they are um, uh, people who are in full-time work or maybe not full-time carers. And this mm. is their 
bit on the side and they're passionate about it and that's also a release as well and um, and that can be a, a, a challenge to get answers it can be a challenge to draw consensus it can be a challenge to engage working out who the person is who's going to be making the decisions I, I learned very quickly that the idea of, of consensus within community projects it's a fallacy it, it, it can't be achieved and if it does then there's prob probably something a bit wrong you know something a bit crazy about everybody going in the same direction it mm -hmm. seems very cold like to me actually yeah so you know don't try to go for that um, the power of communication and reading the room that is something that I just did not learn right but probably had it within me as a kid I come from a very large family and it's, it's a bit like you've got a survival of the fittest <laughs> with three elder siblings you know you gotta you gotta be sharp and so that kind of um, communication of of being authentic you know the authenticity of going into a space and and like looking around the room trying to work out who the key decision makers are how to present who to present to the time scales can also be challenging mm -hmm. clearly the money is challenging because there is no money for the project let alone fee how mm -hmm. do you understand what value that you can get out of it because you need to employ staff and you need to look after yourself and that's you know, um, that's really important. Um, and so these are the, you know, the, I learned more about communication in mm -hmm. those projects uh, than, and really less about the, the, the uh, design skills, really. Um, the design is fairly straightforward, mm -hmm. in fact, but how do you, um, how do you uh, place your design in a room, communicate it, and, understand that not everybody's going to love it yeah that that's really interesting as well like you know that because that's going to impact the decision making ability of a client and when i've spoken with architects in the past who are kind of very in, engaged in community work um some of our own clients even you know they'll often have the challenge of you know they thought there was a decision that was made and now the rest of the congregation or the group has seen it and now there's lots of questions and then there's a fine line between you being an educator and kind of guiding people through a process and then being derailed where you're now communicating why this decision got made yeah to lots of other different groups of the of the thing and just make just that kind of just appeasing everybody and making sure it can be very yeah it, precarious. it can be very precarious but one of the things that I realised early on is that actually people want your guidance. Mm -hmm. You know, you are being paid as the expert to come up with a design. And sometimes it's okay to say, actually, I don't agree with you. And I think in my judgment, this is the way forward. Mm -hmm. It's, I suppose, I suppose you'd call it a strong leadership style of like being understanding and being empathetic to everybody's views that is community engagement taking everybody along the journey with you and that's absolutely fine and that's for the benefit of the of the design and I learn a lot through that but at some stage I also learned to say actually you know we have gone through 20,000 options <laughs> this is the one now you know I strongly suggest that this yeah. is the one that you go for you cannot please everybody and and there can be a game which is played whereby mm -hmm. oh can we do another option oh, can we? like no these are the options now and that is part management of the business mm -hmm. as well it, this isn't endless and I, I think that some charities unfortunately can take advantage of of that as, from a consultant in in the you know um, ar architects are always the first ones to put their hands up and say oh we'll do another design mm -hmm. um, that's not always great and so that kind of idea that actually you know I love you all but actually this is the one to go for and that's what you're paying me and mm -hmm. that takes confidence because at those moments you have to value yourself yeah you have to love yourself basically you've yeah. got to, you've got to say actually I'm, I'm not just here just to like suggest things and say oh you make the decision no no you are the architect mm -hmm. you know and you make the decision and let's see how it goes it's it's uh it, it, we'll talk a little bit about belinda uh one of your your clients and how you 
I remember listening to an interview of you somewhere and you were talking about the she was very hesitant to get in contact with you because she had this image of the sort of um, uh, the fountainhead type of architect who was, you know, in the ivory towers and didn't want to talk to, to anybody. And what you're describing here as well was interesting because it's, yeah, you, you, you do need to be the architect who's being the one who's leading and driving a vision. But if you go too far in that, there's like a, there's this fine balance here of being able to involve and have everyone engaged with the conversation, you making a decision and driving it forward and it not being like kind of unapproachable, unaccessible architect. Yeah, I, I think that there, there is a, you have to move forward, forward on every project. Mm -hmm. Every meeting, there's gotta be a movement forward. And um, it's not about winning or losing arguments mm -hmm. whatsoever. I think that that's, that's quite a, a old school way of, of thinking how a creative process works. Creative process for me works through you know, understanding a client, understanding the challenges, presenting ideas, working through the challenges again, and then making iterative changes so that then you can push forward. And, and, and I think that, that that maybe strong leadership isn't the idea of saying this is the one. But I think strong leadership in a business sense is to lay out a process mm -hmm. and say, look, I don't know where this is going. This design is not about me. I don't have a preconceived idea. You know, it's about you. My idea is to draw out your, the best of you in architectural form. This is the process. We're going to meet here, here, here. We're going to do this, this, this. At some stage, I'm going to be quite... Um, they're clear as to what I think is, is the best idea. Uh, that's okay. You're going to be doing the same to me, aren't you? That, 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 that's fine. And 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 that's how it goes. So maybe I kind of uh, misplaced my words earlier in, in, in suggesting that strong leadership is 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 knowing what's right. I think that strong leadership is more so knowing what what the process is, right. um, because there can be a lot of anxious people in the room mm -hmm. uh, many, many times who have never have met an architect before, I think we'll perhaps move on to this with, with my other client, and, 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 and if they have or if they haven't, probably have some quite um, preconceived ideas of them, positive mm -hmm. and negative. And to contain those an anxieties, you have to, you've got to do something about it. And to lay out a process can be quite soothing. Mm -hmm. um, I, you can call it the RIBA stages, of course, but actually it needs to be more nuanced yeah. and uh, and it needs to be also those stages have to be authentic to you. Mm -hmm. And that took time for me to actually look at the stage and say, actually, do I see myself delivering that stage in that way there? Mm -hmm. And and that takes time and that takes confidence and it takes learning and it takes a few knocks as well. Um, so I think that, that was a massive learning. Okay, do you... Um lay out the process then at the very beginning of the of the project with the client and what kind of conversations do you have in terms of what you expect from them in terms of their ability to make decisions and their behavior and making sure they pay you on time yeah. what does that initial conversation look like of just setting out those expectations well i think that 10 years ago it would have been a lot different to what right. it is now and i think that this is the hard one business experience yeah, absolutely yeah and that's you know that's kind of been my my journey really and you know every single project our contract documents change every single time because there's something that we've learned from the previous project mm -hmm. it's not about adding more clauses maybe it's about taking taking away really mm -hmm. um but but those expectations are really key you know it's about pay, payment on time <laughs> i suppose it's about payment for work done it's about sign offs it's mm -hmm. about design freezes it's about um uh, no WhatsApp messages. Uh, it's about no text messages. It's about contacting within office hours only. So, uh -huh. so, 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 so these are, and 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 it's about knowing that if you email me on uh, after five thirty, I'm not going to read it until nine thirty mm -hmm. in the morning. So, so, so the, these are the things which which kind of I've learnt to put in place um, for the mental health of me and my staff. Yeah. Frankly, more than anything for the financial security of, of, of my practice as well. But also, you know, giving some flexibility because I always want to suggest to the clients and because it, it is true for my studio that, that actually this is, this is the, 
this is the one time that we do things together and we haven't done this before and so I'm not going to apply everything for the previous client onto this one. So part of that is that we, we, for some clients, we've actually designed the process together. So we design the process and then we go through the process. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are quite clear expectations, timelines, financial constraints. And, and I, I think that what's interesting is that I, I, I've learned to put those, um, I suppose, those markers in place because of some difficult experiences that I've had. Mm -hmm. But of course, the majority of clients are like, well, of course, yeah, of course, we're not going to call you. It's like seven in the evening. So it's just interesting. You, you have to learn through failing. How, it's interesting then, you know, actually mapping out some of those expectations. And there's, there's quite a skill to be able to do it with somebody without being accusational or, you know, saying, you know, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to hold the line. You know, this is how you're going to play the game and still being collegiate. Um, and I know that some of this is a kind of, I, I get the sense from you, you're a very skilled communicator and good with people. So a lot of it's probably happening quite naturally and you know how to read the room and just be yeah. sensitive to, to, to people. Um, it, I mean, how, 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 if you could sort of analyze how you do that, what sorts of awareness do you have around it? Look. I think that it's quite a personal thing that everybody's got to negotiate their, their way through. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I don't like talking about money. You know, I, I, I find it really awkward. Like I'd say, can you pay me at the end of the month if that's okay? <laughs> you know, it like, of course. But, but one thing that I've learned to do is to be comfortable in sharing my vulnerabilities. And so often I may say, look, I've I've a few sensitive points that I'd like to, and anxieties which, they're, they're studio anxieties and I'd like to share them with you if that's okay, and if I could, um, it'll calm me down, it'll calm my staff down, it'll make the whole process run, mm -hmm. and 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 it is incredible when you, you know, when we break down the macho aesthetic that we're told to, um, that that we. Yeah, things have changed a lot, but but we were kind of told to portray in architecture school and, and just say, well, actually, you know, I'm having some difficulty mm -hmm. in this, but I have a plan. Is it okay to share? That's my way of actually doing it. And then, you know, and then the client generally says, yeah, of course, good mean Like, what what's the so look? We're going to invoice at the end of the month. You know, it'd be really great if you, if you could pay. It's like, of course, like, uh, you know, design freezes. We don't want to charge you abortive fees for ch changing things. It may happen, but we'll try to keep that down. So that's what design, of course, mm -hmm. you know, you know, communication, of course, you know, like, of course, go on, uh, go, uh, go on holiday. And, and it's that, and then you'll be surprised, or maybe you won't be surprised, they also share their vulnerabilities. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you know what, you're like really wondering how we're going to get past this at a board meeting level. Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Let me note it down. I want to have a chat about it. And not every project has to be one. Yeah. You know, like I, I've taken on lots of projects for just to get over the line and it's been the worst decision ever. Mm -hmm. And to trust your gut. You know, we do not win every project that we go for by a long shot. And we do, we do not accept every project that, that we're offered, mm -hmm. you know. Because if the relationship isn't right, if, if to one of those questions, you'd be like, well, to be honest, sometimes I do need to call you at 7.30 because something comes in, into my head. So, okay, fine, you know, this isn't gonna work for us. Yeah. And, and to walk away and to have that as a skill and to be brave to do that. That's challenging if you don't have much money in the bank and you don't have a Rolodex for those who are as old as me would, <laughs> will not know what a Rolodex is. A, um, a list of other clients you know it's really hard yeah. it's really hard to say no but you get a sense quite quickly of like is this relationship going to work or not mm -hmm. and just to clarify what I mean by relationship working relationship working as a client professional consultant is not that every everything's happy clappy everything's all great I mean that's a great design you know that's fantastic oh thank you for paying on time the judgment is 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 when there are difficult conversations do you feel at the start of a relationship that you that that when the difficult conversations come 
that you'll get through it. Not do you feel that every conversation is going to be good. Mm-hmm. And that is something that you've got to judge, really, and be comfortable saying no and, uh, and take it step by step. And also to, I suppose, at times, open the conversation to see how the relationship's going, mm-hmm. you know, which is quite scary, actually. It's, it's, it's wonderfully wise, what, what you're describing here. And, and, um, and it may be why, why we haven't grown to, to 25 <laughs> strong. <laughs> well, it, it, how, does, how does this type of relationship impact the design then? Kind of this being this sort of open and being able to have the courage to share vulnerabilities because actually I think that's a that's leadership mm. you know having the courage to be able to share vulnerabilities and also having the courage to not take on a relationship that's going to be detrimental to your own values and <clears throat> the kind of rules that you've set up which is protecting you and your office and ultimately when you're when you're doing that that's going to benefit the client as well so mm. if, so you know having the courage to to say no to somebody takes a lot of leadership and and strength to be able to do it how does this kind of intimate relationships impact the the product, what you're actually designing? Well, ultimately, I think that the the client want, wants the best of you, and and all that we are outlining to them is what conditions we feel will result in the best work being produced. And there'll be other client, other consultants, other architects out there who have different rules. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely fine. Like, I, I, th- this is not a blanket policy to all, you know, ARB members. It's a, it's a blanket policy for my studio mm-hmm. and the clients that we'd, we'd like to work with. And so if, that, if I can communicate that well, um, then it's hard for a client to say, actually, no, we're going to carry on like, doing some really, you know, rule-breaking stuff. And we're happy for you to to be eighty percent of your capacity in terms of design. It's like obviously everybody wants the person who they're paying to give their best work, mm-hmm. and I'm being quite clear what it takes for us to to be the best at what we do in my studio. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's quite. Um, I think it's quite a fairly easy conversation to have actually, because uh, because it'll take a strange person to then say actually. Um, we, we still want to point you, but we want to do it to my rules. Um, but the logical way would, would be for the client, and the positive thing for the client to say at that stage is that like, that's great, you're not the architect for us. Yeah. And I'm like, that's great, good luck. Yeah. That's absolutely fine. Shake hands, parts, friends. It's all cool, it's yeah. all cool. And, and we'll see you in a few years time when, you, when you've ditched the other architect because they're rubbish. <laughs> and that, not, 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 to, not to go on about that, but a lot of our, clients for our most you know most published work is because we are the second architect appointed not the first one interesting interesting and, and um yeah so it's actually you know, that that ability of creating relationship and communication really yeah. is what's underpinning yeah. a lot of the 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 design or the it's facilitating design maybe I think it's I, I think it's sad for those first architects actually because they you know they're probably young emerging practices maybe not too dissimilar to me and, and they've dropped the ball somewhere mm-hmm. you know and the clients that, that then come to us after having ditched those ones you know I think that they're really good clients <laughs> really yeah. supportive clients and so something's happened you know I think that if something's happened in our profession if 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 consultants are being dropped, you mm-hmm. know, and so I, I, yeah, I don't say say it as a as a as a woohoo moment for Office Yard. It's just an interesting thing mm-hmm. that actually the reasoning why um, clients are, are are sometimes move from consultant to consultant. Well, it, it's you know whenever we've done surveys with clients or we've had feedback from architectural clients or the Reba's done these those sorts of client surveys. The number one issue that they'll often have with the architect is something around communication. Obviously, just the word communication is incredibly broad and it doesn't really give us much insight into what, what that means. But I think what you're outlining here is like you've set out a, a kind of clear set of rules of engagement and presented it in a, in a very mature manner that's empowering for both parties. And it's, it's, it's there to play by and either you play, play with it because this is here for both of us 
or it's not a fit and that's absolutely fine and not doing that could make a relationship very vulnerable to absolutely on on a in a relationship in a dynamic or a relationship which by definition will be strained at some stage because mm -hmm. it is a very stressful process i think it comes down to fees you know like i could i've been in situations where communications where everything becomes stra strained because there isn't enough money to actually do, do the stuff you know to actually do it mm -hmm. so i think it is about fees i think it is about knowing what you want to communicate and then having the allocation of fees to resource for it mm -hmm. and of course some projects are loss making some projects are profit making but but you know if if architects value themselves more you know i think we need to push up fees now i think you know enough's enough we just need to communicate that um, and how damaging it is for everybody Mm -hmm. if if um, consultant fees are just rock bottom how do you how do you number one how do you talk money with clients um, and there's a couple of things here one is the client's own budget for their construction and sometimes you're you know if you're working with a, a charity there's all sorts of financial issues there's uncertainty of how much money they can raise or they haven't raised the money or they don't know where the money's coming from or that it's coming from drips and drabs and part of your service is to help them fundraise and then also there's the conversation about your own fees and having that understood by a client of why they are what they are because often there's a you know a miss a misalignment of expectations of what the architect fees are and you know often from a client's perspective certainly private clients they'll look at the architecture fees depending on you know the kind of um, sort of tier of project that you're working on and it's not uncommon for them to be incredibly surprised at what the fees are but it's not related to anything it's just mm. a it's just what they wanted to pay for an architect yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's about demonstrating value you know very obviously what this is what you get for this is the money that that you pay and I think it can also be about um, demonstrating the reduction in risk mm. if you uh, invest in good quality consultants who spend the time risk in terms of uh, built fabric risk in terms of financial risk uh, long-term risk you know so these are if we as architects can demonstrate to clients that if you pay us a reasonable wage we can resource something and be honest about it and it de-risks your exposure. Mm -hmm. It sounds so obvious, doesn't it, really? You know, it, I mean, it's kind of like trying, trying to justify our profession, really. But, but, that, but that, that, I think, is the way forward. I think it's a different conversation between private clients and public sector clients, and maybe a different conversation with third sector clients mm -hmm. as well. I mean, public procurement in the councils is you know, it's challenging, and fees are quite arbitrary frankly mm -hmm. um, uh, but in the private sector I think that is the way to that is the way that we demonstrate it, it is to I suppose it's also to show our experience it's like this is what we did previously this is the process that we went went through your outcome is going to be completely different but this is how we make sure that we pretty much start on time finish on time within your budget and have the less moments of stress mm -hmm. as possible in a very stressful global condition which is working with an architect and a, and a builder um, yeah it, it is about demonstrating that, that that value so so often we will go through each stage and highlight outputs right you know, kind of uh, yeah showing the risks of what would happen if they if you weren't involved. yeah yeah I think that the that the risks are fairly obvious when you show the outputs. I mean, mm -hmm. why would anybody know what an architect does? Like, mm -hmm. what, like, like, I'm still working out what an architect does, frankly, you know, and why, why would we expect anybody else to know it? It's a big fee, mm -hmm. you know, like, I can't imagine myself uh, commissioning an architect. Well, I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting, I, you know, I, when I've worked or I worked with designers or architects myself and then I even get surprised yeah. and you're like oh, hold on a minute hold on I did this it would day in day out why am I getting surprised with it and I've been yeah. on um, and yeah you're right it's a complex professional service that absolutely needs 
that sort of elucidation around it. Absolutely, and that elucidation is uh, is lacking as, as a profession. If we compare to other professions outside of the built environment, mm -hmm. obviously we're not even at the starting post. The obvious ones are the legal profession and the other, you know, medical profession, perhaps. Um, but even within our the, the built environment, you know, if we uh, compare the the um, the critique of fees across professions, across architecture, compared to structural engineers, M and E, QS, you know, and the architects are um, uh, often instructed to take a leadership role. Maybe they're not even instructed to. It's naturally there because we coordinate. You know, we have. Um, we have just gone to the bottom of, of, of the of the pile, and it, and, it, and, it, and it is insane. insane. It's absolutely absurd. You know, when I mean, we look at the liability as well, you know, the runoff of a project when architects carry liability for the next six to yeah. ten years or so, and then the contractor might not have as much liability, like in terms of length of time, as yeah. as, as the architect does. So that's just bonkers. And, and it and it is. I think that post George Floyd's tragic murder, you know, there is there has been a push towards diversification within our industry and many other I industries i think that is great and and it is working to some part but i think that public sector clients uh, and private sector clients all clients need to think about whether they are fully engaged in that process mm -hmm. because if i'm trying to uh, employ uh, a, an architect or a part two or a part one from a, a non-traditional architectural background um, then, um, then money means more to them. Frankly, everybody should be paid well, regardless of what background you're from. But especially if we're trying to diversify our profession and, frankly, the professional society to create better outcomes mm -hmm. for for you, the client, then the clients have got to pay more so that we can pay our junior staff members so that they can live in London. Yeah. Forget about, you know, working on it so they can live in London. Mm -hmm. And that is far beyond the minimum wage, mm -hmm. frankly. And that is and and so this kind of these kind of ethics statements, EDI statements which always come from clients, not all clients, some clients who say like we are for this, but then the fees are rock bottom. It is, it is hard to see how they think mm -hmm. the profession can be uh can be more democratized. Yeah. And, and the entry well, that, can go that's, in. That's like, how, how did they think? Yeah. But that, that's that's wild. Like, you, you know, you've got the client making the DEI kind of requirements like you would get with a public, public authority. Mm -hmm. And the profession itself is struggling with, you know, diversity. And, you know, I, I echo the same sentiment that really the problem of diversity in the profession is a financial one. Yeah. And, you know, when I've... Uh, uh, interview to people from different ethnic backgrounds, and you know sometimes it's the it's the case that they're the first generation to even go to university. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's an expectation and responsibility for them to look after their parents mm -hmm. or send mon money back. There's a, a, a higher level of you know responsibility of where their finances needs to be going. So just looking at the basic maths of it, it doesn't work out for an architect mm -hmm. to be getting paid, you know, such a lowly starting fee and you know and it i mean that's not so bad it, but you've just spent 10 years yeah exactly i mean I, I was very fortunate i went through university i'm old enough to go through when my fees were, were paid for yeah you know and um and they were means tested and, and like easily qualified for that i mm -hmm. mean it, the th we we take on a lot of work experience students um and and they're all bright and they're all keen and they work with us for a week and um and, and we speak to them a lot and i and I speak to them, and and the 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 case for them to be retained or to go into the architecture field, I'm finding that case harder and harder to make because mm -hmm. these are bright kids who could, they could do anything, you know, and they could do dentistry, they can do medicine, they could do law, shorter courses, hard courses. They're bright enough to do it with job prospects, a, a starting wage which is higher, mm -hmm. and after 10 years a wage which is way higher and you know these kids are like looking at me and saying well you know yeah I like architecture but you know I don't love it <laughs> like yeah. 
and and that's not you know when I started at eighteen, I liked architecture. I didn't love it. Yeah. You know, so that's you know that that's fine. Mm-hmm. How are we going to retain these bright kids? You mm-hmm. know, and um, and I, I and I kind of uh, you know struggle to see how that is going to happen. What do you think is the, you know the responsibility here from some of the kind of overarching institutions in terms of how the role of the architect or the value of the architect is communicated? Uh, could you be specific about which institutions we're talking about? The ROBA, for example. I think the ROBA do uh, a decent job at communicating within their remit. You know, not everybody needs to be a member of the ROBA, firstly. You know, so it's not, it, 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 it's a position where they um, promote best practice, not uh, not necessarily minimum practice. Mm-hmm. That's the ARB, isn't it, really? And so I think that they 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 communicate it the best they can. I know they have bursaries, and I and I know. I mean, I've I've worked with the ROBA on on a few schemes to try to communicate what architects do um, do better and to a wider audience. And I will continue to do that. You know, that's what I'm I'm really passionate about trying to get more people interested in talking about architecture. Um, but 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 I do think that. Um, that in a TikTok world and a YouTube world, why the RABA isn't heavily investing in a communication style which is more accessible to to a fourteen or fifteen year old, I do wonder why the RABA didn't try to you know I don't know um, sponsor grand designs, mm-hmm. you know like it it is a massive show you know. For good or bad, you know, I don't watch it, but that's because I, you know, I perhaps don't want to watch. You have enough of the dramatization. Yeah, yeah, in, but in but your own, in running your own project. But the idea is 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 to uh, you know put put I put the RIBA in a place where it's in a civic or community setting, mm-hmm. you know, to make it you know accessible, and you know I think that that is challenging if your headquarters is an important place. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's challenging if you have royal in, in in front of it. These are not things that, that I'm saying should change, mm-hmm. but I think that there 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 should be, and maybe there are. I know I know lots of good people who are working within the ROPA, but I think that, that that pace of change needs to be quite quick to try to um, communicate mm-hmm. better. I think also it's limited what the ROPA can do. You know, it's a member organisation. Yeah. It's you know, there's only so much money they could put into to resourcing. Um, so it's I suppose it's up to advocates of of these I suppose um, values to speak up and mm. to and to carry on speaking up really. Um, and you know, I would also say the Architecture Foundation is is, is a really wonderful organisation where mm. they champion. Um, up and coming practices, and in a way which I think is accessible. Uh, I think open house probably does more than everybody really to 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 um, to bring architecture to a wider audience, mm-hmm. uh, to opening up of world class buildings um, and talks, walks, and tours, and all, and, all, and all that kind of things. And and so so I think that there are there are few organisations out yeah. there. It shouldn't just be the RIBA. Um, and uh, but there's a long way to go, actually. Yeah, I I, I suppose on the, the other side of it, there's a lot more ability that we have as individual practices to be able to communicate now with the with things like TikTok and Instagram and social media and the ease, you know, the the barrier, the the financial barrier to being able to communicate at scale has dropped significantly, like you know, like never before, and it's whilst it requires a different type of investment in terms of time and just learning how to language something it's there it's it's yeah. it's there as a as a possibility and there's a lot of um scope for certainly small practices to be able to start to to message and com- and communicate yeah i think that that's that's what what we've been doing what i've been doing mm-hmm. over the last few years now i think it comes down to authenticity yes. i think that there is um I think how however you do it, you know, there, there isn't one size fits all. But if you can break out of this rigid 
vision of version of sorry of of the architect mm -hmm. and be yourself i think that generally that that draws better engagement uh and i use the term engagement in in the modern social media term yeah um uh, unfortunately <laughs> i do know what that means um i think that gets more engagement across different sectors so authenticity is is important mm -hmm. and i know that's something that, that you do really well and i think that probably how you do it probably jars a lot of architects frankly mm -hmm. but, I, but i think that kind of authenticity is really important in in communicating and, and also because I, I think that, that that we talk about the diversification in terms of different you know genders backgrounds ethnicities but there's also the that you know we need to have different uh, diversification of different personalities mm -hmm. and, and a, a neurodiverse workplace as well and when I was uh, a young chap um, there was a particular style of architect and then kind of is now as well it's quite bombastic mm -hmm. um, male and, and like pushing it forward um, with a with a wearing a formal suit and uh, it's true sometimes I do wear formal suits because I love them but um, but there should be a place for different expressions mm -hmm. and um, and social media is a wonderful free tool to showcase who you are at, and also at the same time show great design mm -hmm. you know I, I I do get asked to speak a lot about engagement and uh, communities and the diversification of our profession but fundamentally i want to talk about architecture mm -hmm. and and how we design and produce buildings and to do that more and more i think is in a diverse environment is challenging if we don't call out fees yeah absolutely absolutely but social media to your point ryan is 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 has helped me to speak out about mm -hmm. certain things and many other practices so. it Looking at the taking on the, the subject of of fees, um, you know this is obviously such a hot topic for many for every practice for every architect. Uh, what do you think are some of the things that individual architects could be doing to re raising their fees? And also, what what do you think about employees? Because employees often might um, are sheltered in a way from fees but they're not because their salaries are as a result of it and there's often a lot of misunderstanding from uh, employees and this is you know, might be a result of the architectural education um, where we don't necessarily understand what how our how fees and salaries are related um, but what, what do you think individual architects could be doing to raising their fees and what's what advice would you give to employees about fees and and how it relates to their salaries second question i'm not too sure mm -hmm. um, I, I think that um yeah I, I think that's a really fascinating question because i think that there is a relationship to what when, when i was a part two and when my boss told me actually do you know that this is how much it costs for us to employ you mm -hmm. um i was my whole ex existence <laughs> changed at that point i was like okay i'd better do some work then <laughs> yeah uh, and i won't go into the context of that conversation but but it was a, a really valuable business lesson and it was done in a very nurturing way mm -hmm. i've got to say um but i don't know what the answer to that, for, to that second question is because i think that how you communicate to your colleagues about how much um, they're being charged out. I mean, instinctively, I would try to communicate in a way of how much they're valued. Mm -hmm. You know, we value you this much because you do great work. You know, this is why we love sitting next to you mm -hmm. and producing I ideas, some of which are working, some of which are not. Don't worry about it, but this is the value. Mm -hmm. uh, this is how much it costs, yeah. you know. I, I don't think it's a natural conversation to have. I don't think necessarily you need to have it to every mm -hmm. staff member, but maybe I think that there is a moment in their journey where where that could be approached. Yeah. Um, and for me, it, it was it was good. Yeah. Because it kind of made, made me um, value myself more, frankly. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think in general, I, you know, I'm very encouraging of 
practices to be transparent with their finances and to empower you know certainly younger members of the team when they come in like here's what your salary is how do, here's how it relates you have to tell the whole team what everyone else is earning i don't think that's particularly useful um but certainly you know showing an individual here's what we you know you know what you're getting paid and here's what we bill you out at and here's why we bill you out at yeah. three times more than yeah, yeah. Yeah. than than you know and I, li I like that actually putting it in the frame of you know you're actually yeah. a very valuable part of the team and we're billing you out at that and your work is actually paying for the yeah, yeah. the office the, the overheads and everything like that i i recount a story sometimes of a, a young architect uh, i think it was an architectural assistant part two who somehow found my phone number somewhere phones me up on a random tuesday morning and is really upset at their at their boss mm. and they're like oh, ryan you need to speak to my boss i've just found out how much they're you know i'm being exploited mm. you know um i found out how much they're charging the client for the work that i'm doing and i was like okay mm. and he was like it's three times as much <laughs> as what i'm getting paid and i was like well your boss is doing a great job yeah, yeah. that's yeah, what he that's exactly. what he should be doing but that but that kind of indicated a uh a, a misunderstanding that if it wasn't dealt with is going to cause a lot of upset yeah. and frustration and you know I, I, but, it's but, but I think that like my I suppose my nervousness about speaking about that to staff shows the journey and the education that I've been through mm. in in that I'm not blaming that but it, I, I'm a product of an educational system which separated the business and the architecture yes. and here you are like this is what it what, what it looks like with a boss who's who's uh doesn't know how who has to think a lot about how to communicate mm -hmm. how much someone is 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 valued mm -hmm. and um and I, I don't know, maybe things have changed within architectural education, but that seems to me that's a sad indictment of mm -hmm. the education system that, 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 that I went through. Yeah. And maybe um, why you have this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but to the, to, the, to the first question, which is how do you raise fees? Isn't it really? That, that's kind of it. I think it goes back to demonstrating the value, demonstrating the risk points, demonstrating what what the uh, answer is if you went down that route mm -hmm. and, and it wouldn't be pretty and also the power of no you know mm. to actually say look uh, this is these are our values you know and uh, our value is our values are this 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 and I don't think necessarily this, this, this needs to be always described in number of drawings, number of models. It should be, and we do put that on our on our scopes, service, uh, scope of service, whatever. But but I've also tended to describe those values in look. We always take on uh, work experience students mm -hmm. every single year. Uh, we love doing that. It costs money. Um, we uh, forget about minimum wage. We always pay our staff something which is, you know, far in excess of that, because that's what it takes to live in London. We're really proud about that. Mm -hmm. it costs money. Um, you know, we do this. We do this. so. It's it's actually demonstrating a culture. Yeah. And I don't think that we are expensive. Mm -hmm. I, like there are loads of architects out there who are way more expensive. For sure, there are loads of architects out there who are also cheaper. Yeah. For sure. And and so we're we're kind of you know and and I and I know this because because I see fee data and I see salaries and and all this kind of thing really. So so we, it's you know we're in a really you know it's not always the case, but at the moment the studio is in a nice position whereby we have clients who. Have an alignment with 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 values, and sometimes a positive conversation is to say, "Look, we have the same values, but we can't afford it, so we'll do less." Mm -hmm. You know, and that, frankly, easiest thing is to do is, is to take out some of the stuff that yeah, we will do, yeah. reduce your scope. I mean, it's very simple stuff, really. But I think that it is about 
a whole you know the reason why we want to raise fees is to is to have a better way of communicating mm-hmm. through design through conversations through drawings so that we produce better results and we and we increase the standard of living yeah. well I, I i suppose it's interesting as well you know some of the the projects that you might engage with that have very tight budgets that you know the smaller the budget the more the value of the architect yeah right and sure. and it kind of you know i'd be interested in in seeing models of fees where uh, the architect fee is larger as a result of doing more with a smaller construction budget and actually in the proportion of the whole scheme of the project the architect's budget fee is still just a sliver Absolutely. a sliver of this and, and that's something that you know just even to see that as a diagram yeah. sometimes just Absolutely, to see yeah. you know. and, and 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 as you know you know the it's kind of whether it's a small project or a large project in terms of construction value, the amount of work that a conscientious architect does is pretty much the same. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm not talking about rubbish architects. They can do what, what, what they want to, and that's absolutely fine. But for a conscientious architect, and I could name 50 of them, mm-hmm. we're going to be doing good quality work, and we're going to be working hard. And mm-hmm. so the fee scale if you do relate it to that is kind of a bit weird but mm-hmm. basically you know for a half a million pound project or for a two and a half million pound project it's it's not really that much difference in terms of yeah. of like work done um and so that that's quite uh challenging i think also and i think this is where it requires strong leadership from um from authorities and i mean i suppose um not local authorities i mean architectural wide authorities who are, who are promoting architecture it's 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 about when you get into the conversation mm-hmm. you know if the architect can get into the conversation early and if they're a good conscientious architect they can actually set the expectation levels mm-hmm. a lot of the times we get involved in conversations where there have been where there have been other parties of other other stakeholders such as not stakeholders, other interested parties like builders, other consultants, and then, oh, should we get an architect? Oh, okay, so you're too expensive because the builder said it was this, this, this. Not all builders, most builders are absolutely fine. But it, it's about leading the conversation, you know, of, of architects, you know, becoming that leader role again, being paid for that le- <laughs> leadership role. This whole thing about, oh, oh you can project manage it, well, well, no, that that will take fifteen percent more more fee, more time. It's like, is it okay if I increase my fee by fifteen percent as well? What? Like, what, what are you talking about? So actually, getting into the conversation early mm-hmm. um, and setting setting those expectation levels and being realistic about whether the project is a go or not. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe it's not worth spending time and money on architects' fees. It's better to work that out early if the if the budget is going to be tiny you know and and, and that that takes some leadership it takes some mature conversations and it and it takes i suppose the ability to walk away from from projects and say actually no this isn't going to work and it and it takes a proactive attitude to actually thinking about where you want to be positioned within this within this uh, built environment realm you know architects should be at, at the forefront um leading conversations um i think it, it's it's uh, that's been diminished what's the rest of 2024 and looking into next year got planned for for you and the office we are lucky to have some really wonderful projects at the moment and it hasn't always been the case and they're projects whereby we are um we have the resources to express architecture in the way that um that we think that it's going to be beneficial to the final final product um i hate using the word product but um the final environment uh we have a a um, uh, a wonderful new build house in buckinghamshire which mm. is set to go on site for some um for some clients i mean i i, I would call these clients more patrons actually they're they're, they're really invested in this pro- process and really um the only clients who have actually said to me, um, you know what, you meet, um, what is it that that we can do for you to make your life 
easier. Mm. Um, and, and, I, and I was taken aback, and, and I, it took me a few moments, and I just like said, oh, can you just uh, pay invoices within two weeks? And they pay within two hours. Mm-hmm. You know, within two hours. So mm-hmm. that so that is incredible. It's, and it for a small practice, for any practice, for a small practice, it's just great. So that's going on site, and that'll be like an eighteen month build. And it's really one working with a really wonderful builder um, to to actually get that over the line. Um, and we've recently been um, appointed as architects for a a um, a company that makes jeans in Walthamstow. And they have a really old building, and they want to uh, extend it so that it becomes more of a, a community civic space, more workshops for higher composite workshop spaces. They want to have an allotment on the mm-hmm. on the roof and a kitchen and a eating place as well. And that's frankly it's such in the wheelhouse of what we've been speaking about for the last ten years. That um, and maybe it's not a coincidence that these this project has, has come. It's a result of just good communication perhaps um, and so we're uh, stage one in that RIB stage one and that's that'll be a long project and that's and we have other other stuff as well but those are the ones that I, I really want to um, concentrate on um, and yeah keep things going from there amazing well it's been an absolute pleasure for the perfect place to conclude the conversation here but that's been really really insightful and very thoughtful uh, responses to the you know to some of my questions and I know a great level of expertise there of just managing and dealing with clients and and working in these uh, the sorts of projects that you that you do so thank you so much for coming on the show great loved it thank you and that's a wrap hey enix sears here and i i have a request since you are a listener here of the business of architecture podcast ryan and i we love putting this podcast together we love sharing information as much as we can glean from all the other industries that we're a part of to bring it back to empower you as an architect and a designer. And one thing that helps us in our mission is the growth of this podcast, simply because it helps other architects stand for more of their value, spreads the business information that we're sharing to empower architects together so architects, designers, engineers can really step into their greatness, whatever that looks like for each individual. And so here my my simple ask is for you to join us and be part of our community by doing the following heading over to iTunes and leaving a review of the podcast. And as an expression of our sincere thanks, we would like to give you a free CEU course that can get you one professional development unit, but more importantly, will give you a very solid and firm foundation on your journey to becoming a profitable and thriving architect. So here's the process for that. After you leave us a review, send an email to support at businessofarchitecture.com. Let us know the username that you use to leave the review, and we will send you that free training. On the training, you'll discover what 99% of architecture firm owners wished they would have known 20 years ago. And the other 1%, well, they just didn't even know that they didn't know. Head over to iTunes and leave us a review now. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.